Hey everyone, welcome back to the Peacock Podcast for episode three. It's been a couple weeks since I recorded the last one, and I've got lots to talk to you guys about. This episode, I'm going to be, when I'm done talking about the plethora of games I've been playing, I'm going to bring up a topic uh, regarding a reviewer's perspective and discuss a, a discussion that went on in the comments uh, for a game that I really didn't care for. I want to get your opinion on that. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the games on Kickstarter that I have been eyeing up or I was excited about but ended up passing on it. Um, I've got a couple to mention there. And lastly, I'm really looking for some feedback on these. I want to hear what you guys like about what I'm doing, what you think I can do better. This is episode three, so this is the start of it. This is the genesis. I want to grow, I want to get better, and I want to captivate my audience. So please, commenting, discussion, it really motivates me. All right, so that's that's the big lineup for the night. That's what I got planned. So games I've been playing, I'm going to kick it off with a big one. Game that swept the Dice Tower Awards. That's Gloomhaven. This is a monster game. It comes in a box the size of five games. And it has 90 different scenarios that you play through. And it's a cooperative dungeon crawl. The game has its haters like any other, but I think it is a magnificent dungeon crawler. You use card play to kind of, you've got a certain amount of things you can do every game. You get more and more tired. There's certain cards. Um, you've always got two abilities on a card. If you play one with like a, uh, a lost symbol, it's gone for the rest of the game. So you've got a lot, you've got some one-time uses, you've got things that you can keep using, but uh, they don't come back to you till you do a rest. So you're always on a timer and you always have to use your options to accomplish the mission of the quest. And it's usually killing the monsters. And it's really challenging if you start at le like level normal, if you're new to the game. So I watched Tom Vassell's review a while ago and his suggestion to start at easy is right on the money. I fully endorse that. It's at least the first few. It's got such a grandiose feeling. It, other than the combat and the actual dungeon play, the sub game is so much fun. Going to town, the amount of cards that become available as you start leveling up, like there's hundreds of cards. And you get in adventures in town and tons of cards for different kinds of things that can happen. And then traveling from dungeon to dungeon, there's road events that can happen. Eventually you retire a character and there are tuck boxes full of different dudes to use. I haven't gotten to the point where I retired a character, but I sure hope to one day. Uh, this is one that Jess likes to play, so I've got that going for me. It's, it's to sum it up, this is Diablo in board game form, and I have more fun playing it as a board game than I do uh, as a video game. Next game comes from Plat Hat Games, who were haven't done anything much since the buyout with uh, Asmodee, and I think they just took that time to develop a bunch of things they had going, and they've been pumping it out this year, and there's a ton coming out with Gen Con. But one of their newer ones, designed by Isaac Vega of uh, Dead of Winter and Ashes, two games that I love. I mean, oh god, I gotta play Dead of Winter again. It's so much fun when you have the right group for it. But Starship Samurai is an area control game. You start the game with a couple samurai. There's eight total. It plays up to four players, and you draft two samurai each, and they both have a special power that's going to make you distinct amongst the other ones. Every round is divided into turns where players are putting one of their one to four tiles on one of their action spaces on their board. So you're doing one of four things when your turn comes around, but depending on if you're playing number one or number four, that action is going to be better. For example, if I want to collect some money, I will put the four on the the collect money action I would get four money. I could put four on the move units and I can move up to four units. If I put the two on the move units I'm only moving two. Additionally when you start your turn wherever you have more power and the different units the samurai and the two different kinds of ships all have their own power plus you can even spend money to make some of your ships more tougher. You just add these tokens underneath them to beef up your ships. At the start of your turn you're gonna get this benefit 
whether it's rising a token up the alliance track, which I'll explain in a second, or uh, getting a free action like uh, moving some ships or whatever it may be. It's typically moving something up the alliance track. So there's six alliances, I think, maybe eight, and they're all tokens on a board that start at the bottom. And there's a player symbol at the top of four tracks, so each player has their own track. Anytime you get one of those symbols, you can move a token up that track, and depending on how far up that track you are, that's how many, uh, like, the better of the benefit you're going to get. It's either going to be money or it's going to be moving another token up. It almost reminds me of Terra Mystica, which I'm going to talk about next, a uh, game I just played, how in addition to the board, you've got your priests that are moving your tokens up to different tracks. So Starship Samurai has that Terra Mystica thing going on on the side, so you need to pay attention to that. And further to that, there is a deck of cards. There's a couple that you start with, and then there's um, a pile of cards, and that's one of the four actions you can do is grabbing cards from the deck. I believe you can have up to five. And these things are really cards that change the game. They can really screw over the opponent, really give you huge advantages, but that just makes that action more meaningful to grab those cards. Anyone can grab them at any time. Really like the game. I played two two-player games, both with my wife. She asked to play it again, which I was happy to do. I really like what I see, and I'm excited to play it with a higher player count. I think it's going to shine a little bit better, but it really, really plays good at two, amazingly enough. Area control games usually disregard them at two-player, but Lords of Hellas and Starship Samurai, area control type games, dudes on a map, the two don't have much in common, but they both play, they're both the same genre, and they both play good with two players. So, uh, yeah, as I just mentioned, I got to play Terra Mystica, which um, is an extremely popular evergreen game, brilliantly designed, and I've never played it. A good friend of mine learned the rules, had me over, and he had Terra Mystica set up. So there was three of us there. I see what all the buzz is about. I really liked it. It had that track on the side, which is actually how I won the game. I just, I wasn't really getting my towns out. I wasn't being that efficient on the board, so I figured I did throw out one of those uh, round places that lets you get a priest every round, so I used that to my advantage. The other two players uh, were kind of not focusing on that, and... They were mostly focusing on each other, and it being my first game, they didn't pay too much attention to what I was doing over on that board. It's one of those games that you think about after. I'm thinking about all the different strategies I can do, and I can't wait to play it again. Uh, it gives me that kind of uh, Orleans excitement as far as Euro games goes. I love playing Orleans, and I love the way my brain thinks when I'm playing that game. So that's Terra Mystica. Um, as I get to know the game better, I'll be talking about that one further. And to add to that, this really makes me want to pick up Gaia Project. I don't see a sense in getting this when, when uh, Brett and Giselle own this. And I'm hearing the improvements on Gaia Project are a step in the right direction. So I've definitely got my out to buy Gaia Project based on my first play of Terra Mystica. Okay, another game I'm going to talk about, Great Western Trail. This was a four-player game. Then back with Brett and Giselle, my wife and I. Love this game too, one of my favorite Euros. It's one of those games where you, everybody's doing pretty good. And when everyone's counting out their points at the end, you're like, did I win, did I win, did I win? It's, it's my games right now, it hasn't been an obvious blow, like blowout, like somebody's way ahead. Giselle won, we've played three games. Giselle is three for three with the win. She won by two points. She had 70, I had 68. She was the one that got that extra two points for dropping the last worker to signal the end of the game. It was that close. It was epic. It goes along at such a good pace. The choices are great. Moving along. So that was Great Western Trail. All right. We're going to talk about a couple uh, small games here. And these are just ones I've been playing a lot lately to get to know. They're just so quick, smart, and play fast. First one is The Mind. I might have talked about this one last week but i've played this a few more times few more two-player games with just my wife started out with a four-player game night we had we played four players we got to level seven. First time all of us playing together really enjoyed it. it's clever let me ask you guys this when you play the mind do you, does everyone plan at the start it's like all right let's count at this speed in our head 
one, one thousand, two, one thousand. No, 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 that's a little too fast. Let's slow down a bit. Do you guys consider that pre-discussion and the act of trying to time it in your head as completely within the rules and challenge of the game? Or do you think that should not be discussed before each round? Let me know your thoughts. This other game I picked up just because of the publisher. It's a little quick game that plays in 10 minutes and it's from Arcane Wonders who made Onitama. So I was like, this game looks great. I heard a few people say some good things about it. So I picked it up on a whim and it's deadly elegant. I loved it. I've only played two players. It plays up to four and good on Arcane Wonders for jumping behind this game. I know exactly why they wanted to publish it. Loved it. In this game, there's just a bunch of different colored discs in the middle. And each player has a player board with three colored stacks. Th uh, three spots for stacks. And then you've got points representing each of the four colors. Once you score something, you put it behind your card and then it doesn't get messed with. You've got a few different options on your turn. You're either going to take the top tile off of... A uh, tile being one of the little round things in a stack off any pile at all. It could be a stack on your opponent's player board. It could be a stack in the middle of the game, uh, which there's a whole bunch to start the game with. Or a stack on your own player board, and you pull that into your hand. That's the only way you can score points is to make it go from your hand down into your scoring area. Another thing you can do is just take a full stack from the center and put it on your player board. Stacks are always three high. Even if there's less than three in a stack from someone else grabbing one off the top, it's still considered a stack, you'd put that on your pile. And the other option you have is to score points, and that's when you play a tile from your hand. It's a little plastic disc that connects to discs below it. Uh, so say I play a green disc on my green uh, disc scoring pile. If I have any green on the top of any of my three stored stacks, I can also add those, and so can my opponent. So when you're playing this game, you're trying to set up moves where your opponent doesn't have the right colors on top of their stack. You play the right colored card from your hand, and then you get to add a couple more points on top of that because of the way you're stacking. And then at the end of the game, once the last stack is taken from the center, whoever has the smallest stack is just out of the game right off the bat. And then whoever's left, whoever has the uh, tallest stack in any one color, is the winner of the game. It's elegant, it plays in 10 to 15, love it. It's it's almost up there with Onitama, more plays, who knows, but huge good first impressions on that one. Senshi by Arcane Wonders. And this one is a reprint, it's called High Society. I think it's um, I think it's a Reiner Knizia game. And this is a bidding game. It, it, it also plays in, I don't know, I'd say 15 to 30 minutes. It's a deck of cards. Every player starts with some money that starts the game. At the end of the game, you want to be a player that that still has money, but also has lived an elegant, upper-class lifestyle based on the cards that you won during the bidding. If you run out of money, you're pretty much screwed. It doesn't matter how you did otherwise. So it's all about bidding for the right cards, the right amount of money, paying attention with the other players. It's a real cool tug-of-war thing. Uh, we played a few in a row. A few in a row. My wife didn't really uh, didn't really love it, but a couple of the other players at the table really did. Interesting game. Um, if you're into, if you're looking for quick card games that are clever, play fast, a lot of fun. You can put this one in your checkout list. It's a pretty inexpensive game. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Cockroach Poker, though. We that did enter the rotation a couple more times. Played some epic games of it. Uh, if you really want to hear me go into it, you can listen to one of the previous podcasts. I'm sure I'll talk about it more in the future, but I'm always uh, talking about Cockroach Poker because it's always getting played. One of the game nights I've had since the last time I did one of these is a real cutthroat game, and that's Lifeboats. This game is strictly negotiation and voting, and everybody starts in a boat at the bottom of the board. Everyone votes which boat springs a leak. It's not a problem until you, when you, when a boat springs a leak, you put up a little blue disc that fills up a hole, which means there's less room for one of the player's sailors to sit in. But if there's no room, there's no empty holes, then everybody that's in the boat has to vote for which one of the sailors is going to die. You've got two of the big guys that are worth two boats each and like five of the smaller guys. So everyone in there can discuss if there's uh, who they should vote for. And then at the same time, everyone flips up the color that they're voting to get tossed out. Um, you can feel free to lie and 
make deals and break deals. There's also this captain's hat card. Everyone gets three of them. They're one-time use. If you're the only one that plays a captain's hat card, then you can di dictate the outcome of the vote. But if two players play a captain's hat at the same time, two or more, then the captain's hat are null and void. So there's that. But it's really cutthroat. You can't let yourself get hurt feelings. You gotta just kind of go with the flow and not be offended by being manipulated and lied to uh, at the cost of other people moving further ahead. But it's hilarious with the right group if you're into those types of games. And finally, this is a big game I'm going to touch on. Um, I'll be talking a lot more about it in future ones. But that's a song of Ice and Fire. Just did, just got the Kickstarter of it. Now this is a miniatures game, not so much a board game, but it's it's not far from being a board game. It's it's designed by Eric Lang, who needs no introduction in the board game world, and Michael Chennault, who's done some really cool, fun games like Xeno Shift and uh, Rum and Bones. So at first, this game, I was like, oh, it, it looks interesting, but it's just humans against humans. That's not very interesting. If I want to play one of these big miniatures games, I want big monsters on the field and all this other cool stuff. But the part that grabbed me into this and made me pay more attention was the first of all you had the the, the tactics track on the side so you'd have these people you can buy in your army that work their politics behind the scenes and they can affect units in certain ways you can decide where you're going to put them every round they can make a give units more maneuver they can make a unit do a free attack they can uh, hire more units you can decide to buy more than one of these non-combat units because of how beneficial the powers are. And then the benefits that all the different units got with the different characters you can attach to the unit was really giving me like a CCG combo kind of vibe. And I got I got sucked in. I decided to back it and then I pretty much got everything for it. I've got it set up. I played a game, most of a game, after reading the rules of just me sitting there playing both sides figuring out the mechanics because I I'm teaching this to Jess fingers crossed that she can get in this and enjoys it because it's one that I'm really liking my first impressions of there's a lot of good things to say about it to start with it's got a simplistic mechanic at its core as far as the combat goes when you're attacking you roll this many dice this is what you need to hit and then this is how you roll how many dice you got hit with and this is what you need to stop guys from dying when they die you pull them off the back Here's the four different things you can do every round. So they kept that simple and they made it accessible, which is why it stood out for me as a, as a as the miniatures game I wanted to get into over Star Wars Legion or Warhammer Age of Sigmar or whatever, these big expensive lifestyle miniature games. It's because I don't want to buy a different book for every different type of unit and have this long complex variety of armies with huge books of special powers and so much variety in every unit, you would never collect and paint the whole thing. There's just too much going on. Now, sure, that's that that could definitely be the case with, with this. But dollars to dollars, the way, the quality that Cool Mini or Not puts out in miniatures at a way lower price point than Games Workshop and Fantasy Flight, that edged me over because if I really like it, my wife liking the games of Throne, it's more accessible, easier to teach to her and other people, then this this is the one to go for. So that's what won me over was the, the initial mechanics and when you're throwing together your choices on everything from where you're gonna position stuff on the battlefield, who you're gonna take as your commander, what dudes you wanna add to each of your units, how you're gonna spend the points, and then your non-combat units Plus, you can add the neutral units or mercenaries, the one that don't belong to any particular house. I figured this one is the game to get into. So first impressions are really good. I'm, pr I'm getting, uh, I'm pretty confident I can teach this smoothie where I know what all of Jess's units are going to do. So I can be like, hey, don't forget those guys can do that. And that's going to be the best way to get her on board for learning quickly. She loves Memoir 44. Loves it. We've played it tons. Summer Wars loves it. She enjoys mythic battles. So these kind of games can be up her alley and I'm really hoping she takes to it. 
because she's my main gaming companion, other than uh, my nine-year-old, but he's gone for another month before he's back. So uh, that's it, yeah, Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I haven't even opened all the expansion packs, I'm just trying to really get to know the base box. There's also five different modes you can play, which uh, was another addition. So it's got that Eric Lang stream netlineness thing that really attracts me to games. Um, yeah, can't wait to play more and can't wait to tell you guys more about it. So let's move on to um, the discussion topic. Now I mentioned I wanted to talk about things from a reviewer's perspective and I just wanted to pass this question on. This was a game I reviewed, and I'm not going to name the game. You can you can see where all my reviews are on the Dice Tower, so if you want to do your own investigation, go ahead. But at the end of the review, I said, I don't usually like to tell people that a game sucks. I just like to say that it isn't for me. But I can confidently say this game sucks. And I got a lot of feedback on the comment section of the video. Now, there was feedback from a couple of designers, and... Yeah, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, and I I take back that I said that it sucks, but I also feel like I was being honest, and if a friend asked me what I thought of it, I would say the same thing. So, forgetting about the designers being offended, one lady mentioned that I was, she liked the game, right? She may, She didn't come across as a gamer, but she's had a lot of fun with it. So I was so hard on this game that she felt, um, I don't know, she felt bad for liking it or like I was too snooty. Maybe it came across as condescending or holier than thou. But I get her point. Yeah, if you if you really love something and you're you're watching somebody talk about something you love and they go, oh, and this thing sucks, you're uh, you're gonna feel bad about yourself or about your decision or question it. So, do you think it's okay to just to be completely blunt and say this game sucks? And from my perspective, I'm not an authority on whether it sucks or not, but I am a, an authority on my own opinion. I'm trying to say I think this game sucks and people that maybe watch multiple reviews of mine align with my opinion. I think that's the whole point and benefit of a reviewer or from her perspective, do you think she's right where I should not say that it outright sucks? Just that language alone lacks tact and it could easily be softened up just to save people's feelings. And I should say this game's not for me, but here's why you might like it. I might have answered my own question, but I thought it might have been interesting to talk about. I'd love to hear your feedback. So I also mentioned I was going to talk about some Kickstarter games I was looking at. I backed a couple. I backed Terrors of, Terrors of London. This is a deck builder. Now I backed it, but it's just started the campaign. I still got to really look into it. It was just um, really some positive feedback from people in the industry that I respect their opinions of. Some of my Twitter friends or fellow Dice Tower contributors have said good things about it. So sometimes I'll back something just on that alone. I did that with uh, Dawn of Kiev, Rourke, thanks to Robert Gretzlinger. I backed this game because it's an area control game with some uh, political and Euro economy that really attract me. And Robert just said, yeah, this game's awesome. Uh, so I just blindly jumped in on that one and it was pretty reasonable price. It's not a big minis heavy game or anything. Thank God. I don't need to paint any more of those. Then there was this game that I seen on Board Game Spotlight Facebook page. Um, Derek Funkhauser. He's doing this thing where he's doing live plays and promoting Kickstarter games. And this game looks super cool. It's called Nexus. It's like an arena combat game and you can get a pre-painted version and blinged out, it looks amazing, like beautiful. However, I, ch I checked out the Kickstarter and the rule book alone is $50. You cannot get a copy of this game without a $50 rule book. So it's definitely like a high quality game right off the bat you're looking at the tiers it's like hey you can buy a bunch of plastic miniatures for this price you can buy them painted for this price you can get them resin for this price you can get the game with the, with the 50 dollars rule book for 250 us dollars and there's no option just to get the game and maybe regular um here let me uh let me bring up this kickstarter page right now d version nexus oh it's canceled no way. Oh, funding was canceled. 
It made uh, $13,855 uh, with 22 days to go still. So maybe they just want to, uh, maybe they canceled it for the very reason I mentioned. Yeah, because it looks beautiful. And an arena combat game, especially one that's unique and crazy, I can get behind. But uh, no, I mean, yeah, I, I imagine it'll launch again. But yeah, that Nexus game that I was talking about, it's, it was canceled apparently. They're probably just going to revamp their tiers and and take a second run out of it and maybe offer uh some more uh, accessible pre pledge levels but i think i'll leave you guys at that today thanks for listening really i appreciate it help me help this grow please share if you like what i'm doing uh you can check me out on twitter at jaspelodem my star wars name that's j-a-s-p-e-l-o-e-d-m check me out on twitter I'm trying to keep it just board game related, but sometimes I can really go off on a tangent. And I'll see you next time, folks.